according to the schedule, I should start now, and uh, maybe more people coming in, um, but so that they don't come even later tomorrow, <laughs> um, I would just start. So uh, I talked uh, <coughs> about functional adaptive constraints quite a bit, and I already <laughs> said that these have to have a diachronic um, <coughs> component. Now we'll talk about diachrony, but uh, I would mostly talk about uh, mutational constraints, uh, that is, constraints wh which are intrinsically uh, <coughs> diachronic. And I have some problems. I think people have made uh, claims that are too strong. In particular, <coughs> Stephen Anderson. I've had a debate with Stephen Anderson and a debate with Sonia Cristofaro uh, <coughs> in uh, the last... Uh, year and a half or so, and um, I found that an interesting debate, and as a result, I realized that I need a new term, and so I invented this term, mutational constraint. So, uh, Stephen Anderson uh, is talking, uh, or has been talking about diachronic explanation for quite a while. There's a 2008 paper in language, uh, <clears throat> and he has a recent 2016 paper in the Annual Review of Linguistics. So he talks about synchronic versus diachronic explanation. And that paper prompted me uh, to uh, write a response um, in a blog. Um, and I will uh, give you the gist uh, a bit later. And then there was a, this debate with Sonia Cristofaro, uh, <clears throat> by contrast with Stephen Anderson, who is a retired uh, Yale professor. Sonia Cristofaro is uh, um, significantly younger than me. I was even sort of co-supervisor of her dissertation. Uh, <clears throat> she has um, talked about uh, diachronic explanation or kind of source-oriented explanation um, of typological generalizations. And most recently in this book, uh, Natural Causes uh, <clears throat> of Language, but also in some earlier papers. And she told me that she's writing a book about source-oriented typology. And uh, I also reflected that in some discussion uh, on my blog, so I did an interview uh, with her. She had, she had time to discuss these things. I also wrote to Stephen Anderson, but he said, well, sorry, I'm just busy with packing all my stuff here in Yale because he's leaving Yale because he's retiring. So I hadn't had any uh, discussion with Stephen Anderson personally. Uh, <clears throat> but, but his papers are really interesting. Um, and uh, in particular, given that uh, in the 1970s he was one of the most prominent generative phonologists, uh, it's, it's quite striking uh, that he says in this uh, most recent article that there are at present no convincingly demonstrated substantive universals governing the set of possible regularities in phonology, and he cites Juliette Blevins and her book Evolutionary Phonology. So the point of that book is that phonological uh, patterns that we see in languages, so alternations in particular, or phonotactic restrictions, uh, basically all kinds of phonological patterns that phonologists worry about actually have a diachronic origin. Uh, so instead of calling her book Diachronic Phonology, she had called it evolutionary because that sounds better. And she also has a stronger claim. She doesn't just want to talk about how sound, cha sound systems change, but how the current state of sound systems is uh, influenced by their evolution. So <clears throat> an example that Juliette Blevins uh, gives is uh, final devoicing. So in a uh, Russian word, uh, finally, uh, you cannot have voice obstruents. In German, even syllable, finally, you cannot have voice obstruents. And uh, Juliette Blevins says that's simply the result of a diachronic change of devoicing uh, in the final position where there are some phonetic reasons uh, why voicing uh, is strongly uh, disfavored. And then some people say, well, but uh, <clears throat> what about cases like final voicing? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this <laughs> appears in uh, my Grammar of Lesbian from 1993. And quite amazingly, the lesbian final devoicing got really famous. So Alan Yu had a paper in language in 2004, and Juliette Blevins discussed it, Kiparski discussed it, and then here Stephen Anderson discusses it again, so lesbian final, final voicing is now really famous. Originally, of course, the analysis is not mine, but it's Trubert Skoy's, because Trubert Skoy in the 1920s was working with lesbian speakers. I actually don't know the history of Caucasian fieldwork, 
whether he actually went to Dagestan, so some of you may know that. Anyway, so this old uh, work by Trubetskoy on lesbian is sort of still reflected in, in current debates. And the uh, <coughs> uh, take uh, that Stephen Anderson has on this is to say, well, precisely the fact that such exceptions are possible shows that uh, the final devoicing is not some kind of requirement of universal grammar. But that's just uh, an outcome of very frequent histories. And in this lesbian case, it was just an unusual kind of history, probably involving something like um, strong voice consonants, like maybe in earlier lesbianism was Chebedi and Gaddu, and then the Gaddu became Gattu. Uh, uh, but at the end of the syllable, uh, there was no change because it was not double. Uh, so um, an example then of diachronic explanation in syntax that Stephen Anderson gives, he's uh, worked quite a bit of Icelandic, is that Icelandic lacks nominative reflexive pronouns. So <clears throat> if you have um, um, construction uh, like um, he considers himself to be sick, um, then uh, that's not possible because uh, the himself uh, has to be in the nominative in this construction. But you can say uh, he said that he lacked that ability because in this construction the lack uh, verb uh, takes an accusative subject. So that in a construction where a nominative is required, also in 2C, John says that he won't come unless you invite him you just cannot use this reflexive because it doesn't exist in the language. He says, well, that has a historical explanation because in earlier Icelandic reflexives worked differently. You couldn't have them in subordinate clauses and, and so on. So I don't want to get into the details, but it, it sort of shows that, uh, you know, a kind of binding theoretic explanation he finds um, is not really useful. It's just a historical residue. Okay, so my... A question then, this is from my blog post to Stephen Anderson, was, but can diachronic explanations also account for universal tendencies? Because these are two different things. You know, language particular facts, like this lesbian finally voicing in Icelandic uh, <coughs> reflexives, and universal tendencies. And this course is called Explaining Universals, because I'm particularly interested in explaining universals, and because I'm generally pessimistic about explaining language particular facts. So, <clears throat> not only idiosyncrasy. So, Anderson is not as clear about this as he should be. What, uh, one of the, his examples in the 2016 paper, the lack of a nominative reflexive in Icelandic, clearly concerns an idiosyncratic phenomenon of one language, Icelandic. The other examples do seem to concern universal tendencies. We'll see a few of them later. And he also has a paper in 2005 about morphological universals, where he says the universals are explained by... Um, uh, diachronically. So that's how he really got interested. Uh, because after all, explaining individual facts by diachrony, that's, that's normal, right? I mean, we all have these nice stories to say, well, you know, the, the reason why, I don't know, uh, Russian has kalyasa, but also okola is that, you know, just to be kola and then the plural kalyasa, and, you know, you know many of, the, of you know these nice things that normal people don't know, but they're really idiosyncratic things. So, uh, <clears throat> Anderson does not say clearly that the universal tendencies are due to universal factors. He repeatedly talks about common paths of diachronic development, but common is not the same as universal. Now, suppose tone commonly develops from the loss of a syllable final consonant. Then this may lead us to expect that tone languages have open syllables. Sure. But if there's another equally common or more common source for tone, maybe syllable initial consonant quality, then the expectation disappears. So you have to say not only that tone develops from syllable final consonants, but that it only develops from syllable final consonants. So in order to explain a universal tendency by diachrony, one has to claim that there is a diachronic asymmetry. Not only is the diachronic path A to B common, but the reverse path B to A is impossible, and also maybe a path C to B or so is also not possible, right? So A to B is the only diachronic path. So we need notion of universal directionality of change if we want to explain universals uh, by diachrony. So <clears throat> in order to convince me that we should pursue diachron diachronic explanations of universals, 
I need to see evidence that the diachronic mechanism is also universal. Accidental diachronic developments cannot give rise to diachronic uh, <coughs> to, to, to um, universal patterns. Okay, is that clear? Any questions? So um, after this, um, after thinking about, you know, after being stimulated by Anderson to think about these things, I uh, invented this new uh, term mutational constraints. So we already saw there's functional adaptive constraints, what, what facilitates communication for hearers and speakers. These are the kinds of constraints that I'm most interested in. Then representational constraints, what is cognitively um, demanded within the innate language faculty. Then the mutational constraints, what is preferred or required in language change. One can also say change constraints. Uh, <clears throat> and then Anderson also talks about acquisitional constraints. I will mention those um, <coughs> later. So, um, right, so on this slide actually there's not anything new about functional adaptive constraints. So, um, <coughs> the kinds of factors that have been invoked by functionalists to explain cross linguistic distribution. You know, just this example from phonology, phonological inventories favor five vowel systems because these make the best use of the acoustic space. It seems that De Boer 2001 is uh, the key reference here. Um, case systems, um, referential prominence, uh, and role rank. We talked about this yesterday. Um, <clears throat> now, I call these uh, functional adaptive rather than merely functional to emphasize their role in explaining systems and not usage. Uh, because functional, you know, might think about the functioning of language. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, you know, there's many functional linguists who focus on understanding language usage, but I really want to explain how systems come to have the properties that facilitate communication. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm not talking about the functions of individual parts of the system, so, so I've, I find this notion of adaptive a uh, better. I thought of perhaps dropping functional entirely, but then people don't understand anymore. So maybe in the future we can talk exclusively about <clears throat> adaptive. But then you know, somebody else might say, oh no, something else can be adaptive in a non-functional way or so. So for the time being, I'm happy with this, with this term. I'm much happier with this term, for example, than with the term external explanation that was used, for example, by Jeff Good in, um, in 2008 uh, in his overview article in the volume on language universals and language change. Uh, Frederick Neumeyer has also used external explanation uh, as opposed to internal explanation uh, <clears throat> which uh, is sort of more of the structuralist generative type. Uh, but really, all the four constraints um, that I use are external in the sense uh, that they're not part of the system. Um, so, and then if you talk about system internal explanation, then these are just another word for what I called descriptive explanation earlier. Right? So, I, remember, I distinguish between descriptive explanation and causal explanation. Causal explanation is always external. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so representational constraints, just briefly, we'll talk uh, more about them uh, tomorrow. And if you downloaded um, that file, which is now up, then you also have uh, the handout for tomorrow. So you can already prepare yourself and then perhaps better object to what I'm saying. Uh, or you can skip tomorrow's lecture because you already uh, have that handout, whatever. So I finally managed, sorry, I didn't attend Nick's lecture because I felt I had to finish my, my handouts. Uh, so tomorrow I'll be free to, co to come to Nick. Uh, <coughs> uh, so representation constraints are the kinds of factors that have been invoked by generativists to explain cross-linguistic universals. In the principles and parameters framework, they were called the principles of universal grammar. Nowadays, I'm not sure what they're called, but it's still the, the current minimalist approach is still very similar to the principles and parameters in, uh, in many ways. So, for example, the principles of X bar theory, binding theory, have been regarded as representational constraints as well as universal features and hierarchies of functional categories. And the idea is that from a fairly recent paper that the unattested patterns do not arise as they cannot be generated in a manner consistent with universal grammar. Representational constraints are usually regarded as very strong. So, you know, in, I use this notion constraint for any kind of uh, 
causal factor, whether it's weak, um, you know, then would it be preference or very strong, it's a restriction. Um, representational constraints are usually regarded as restrictions, so universal grammar is also said to be restrictive. Um, <coughs> goods, um, in goods paper, these are called structural explanations, but, um, you know, again, I don't find structural explanations so uh, transparent because, uh, you know, there's structure um, everywhere. It doesn't have to be in the mind, right? There could be structure in an abstract, platonic, uh, Saussurian, long or so. So uh, I find representation better than really refers to mental representation. Okay, now come the mutational constraints or change constraints. Constraints on possible diachronic transitions or possible diachronic sources which can have an effect on synchronic distribution. And <clears throat> actually Greenberg talked about this even back in 1969 and in the 78 article he gives this example if nasal vowels only ever arise from vowel nasal sequences, this explains that all languages with nasal vowels also have nasal consonants. That nasal vowels are rarer than oral vowels in the lexicon. So this is a case where you have a change from A to B, and B can never uh, come from anything else, and also A can presumably never become anything else. But nasal consonants may well disappear, and nasal vowels are still preserved. Why not? Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So, so it could be that, th that there's a language where um, it's hardly to figure out, but in principle, right, it's not that, that there's a language uh, <coughs> where the nasal vowels disappear not only in the position after vowel, but also in the position before vowel, basically, so that they become stops or something else. So you have to add some presuppositions to these mutational constraints. Um, <coughs> there could be why something changes. It's the same with tone, right? So it's, it could be that. Uh, the tone language um, develops its tone from the syllable final consonants that disappear, but at the same time, there could be some kind of syncope change with, let's say, all short vowels disappearing, you know, like the Slavic years, and then you get lots of closed syllables again. So, um, so these mutational constraints are, are tricky. Uh, and I already mentioned um, on Sunday uh, the infix the, the infixation affixation universal, and this, according to Planck, uh, also has the diachronic explanation. If infixes only ever arise by metastasis from adfixes, this explains that they only occur in peripheral position. Well, okay, this is a bit different, right? So, two days ago I said that every language that has infixes also has adfixes, so suffixes or prefixes, and now the universal is that if a language is infixed, it always appears in the peripheral position, so you will not have an infix and completely in the middle of the word. Or uh, if, um, yeah, uh, positions only arise from nouns and possessor noun constructions, then this explains that the position correlates uh, with the position of possessed nouns, and I already mentioned this. So this is just repeated. <coughs> now this notion of uh, mutation constraint is not completely new. Planck 2007 uh, has this term diachronic law. But I introduce a new term in order to make clear that the causal factor is located in the process of change rather than diachronic change, merely realizing a pattern that's driven by functional adaptive constraints. And uh, you know, the, the main reason why I wasn't happy with this idea of diachronic explanation is that I'm saying, well, you know, my functional adaptive explanations, they have a necessary diachronic component. They, you cannot call them synchronic explanations. That, that was also a reaction to Sonia Cristofaro, who said, I'm using diachronic explanations, and then I'm opposing this, that to um, synchronic functional explanations. I'm saying, no, no, my functional explanations are adaptive. They're evolutionary adaptive. They're, they're also diachronic. But the diachrony does not have its own uh, contribution, so to speak. The diachrony only implements what the functional adaptive constraint demands, so to speak. Mm. Then one could also uh, frame the contrast between mutation and functional adaptive constraints in terms of source-oriented versus result-oriented factors. So that's the way that uh, Sonia Cristoforo uh, talks about it. Uh, <coughs> or one could say that mutational constraints 
locate the causal factors within the mechanisms of change. So, so uh, Cristofaro emphasizes more the source, sources of change and Bari emphasizes more the mechanisms of change, but in many cases it's really uh, the same. So I, I think these are just alternative ways of saying that cross-linguistic distributions are due to mutational constraints. Uh, <clears throat> and the result-oriented um, language is actually not so bad. So I'm act actually quite happy to say that, you know, for example, when we talk about differential object marking, that yes, I'm adopting a re result-oriented uh, view. So, you know, the languages add these special accusative markers uh, in order to, uh, or even goal-oriented, right, teleological, in order to mark deviations from canonical row reference associations. So I, I find that okay as long as we realize that, of course, these are evolutionary processes and it's not, you know, anyone deliberately changing the language or so. So I've sometimes also talked about pull forces that attract the, the variable development in a certain uh, place. Of course, these are all metaphors, but uh, especially the attractor uh, notion uh, is often used uh, in various uh, fields. Okay, and then there are acquisitional constraints, factors that impact the acquisition of language, and that also have an effect on cross-linguistic distributions. Such constraints are briefly discussed by Anderson in 2016, but they don't seem to pl play a big role in linguistics. So, you know, just because Anderson highlighted them, I mentioned them here, and here's also the picture that Anderson gives in his 2016 article. I don't understand that fully, uh, but um, <coughs> certainly G, uh, this, is, uh, this is a brain, and this is, no, C. Only cognitively possible grammars can be acquired, right? So these are the um, representational constraints. And the utterance is the primary linguistic data. Uh, that's where Anderson locates um, all these diachronic changes. So, so he doesn't really distinguish between mutational and functional adaptive constraints, uh, I think. And then in addition, he has uh, this learning algorithm in the middle. So only languages accessible via the available learning procedure can be acquired. Um, so, but I'm not going to talk about them more, and I'm afraid I cannot answer questions about them, right? <laughs> just for completeness. <coughs> okay, so, uh, as I said, functional adaptive constraints become part of the conventional system through diachronic change. That's kind of a conceptual necessity. Adaptation presupposes a process of evolution. There is no such thing as functional adaptiveness without prior change. And, and John Bybee's paper from 1988 was uh, really uh, quite foundational for that. So before that, uh, a few people talked in that way. And I still remember I started studying linguistics in 1982. And when this paper came out in 88, I thought, wow, is that really the case? Because I thought that functional explanations also work without diachrony. Uh, but it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of right, but we'll discuss it a bit later. Now, the alternative, you know, might only be creationism. So one might suppose that adaptiveness becomes part of language through purposeful actions of a bene benevolent creator. You know, now, in, in biological evolution, that is, of course, a position that many people hold for very rigid ideological reasons. Uh, <clears throat> but for language, interestingly, nobody has, that, has, pro has proposed that, as far as I know. I mean, not even in the past when everybody assumed that a benevolent creator was very important to take into account in understanding the world around us. So I haven't come across any medieval or renaissance work or so where people said, oh, languages have these useful features because God gave them these features. If you come across this, I'd be, I'd be interested. But it's purely for historical interest, not because I want to consider it. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, of course, also in other areas of cultural adaptation, institutions like ru rulers or upper classes or so, you know, they take a while to evolve and likewise linguistic uh, adaptation evolves uh, over time. And how exactly does it evolve? How, how exactly does it happen? I can't say much about this. I, I find it puzzling myself. You know, we often hear things like, grammars code best, what speakers do most. So somehow, uh, grammars are adapted to the needs of performance, or hard constraints mirror soft constraints, or grammatical rules are crystallized usage preferences. But, but how can language use have an effect on the language system? So for Saussure, that was certainly not 
something that he thought much about. Uh, so he compared language with a symphony whose reality is independent of the manner in which the musicians perform this uh, symphony. The errors that the musicians sometimes make uh, compromise uh, the reality of the symphony in no way. So the symphony is there, and uh, you know the next time a better group of musicians play the symphony, it will still be the same symphony, right? Now language, of course, is different in that uh, the symphony is not written down anywhere, <laughs> but the next musicians only have the former musicians uh, sort of to take his input, and and then somehow that drives the whole machinery, uh, apparently, um, right? So also in Chomsky's view, somehow that that doesn't have much. Um, of a place. Uh, in usage-based linguistics that is very prominent, so language structure is considered together with language use. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, what the usage-based linguists say is, well, yes, language is an abstract system to some extent. Yes, it is to some extent constrained uh, by the properties of the language faculty, but to a large extent it's shaped by language use, or shaped by the needs of language use. But what does this mean, shaped by? Um, so, you know, I'm often frustrated when I hear shaped by, you know, because this has a, you know, if there were a creator, then it's fine, you know, creator shapes, <laughs> but who, who, is, who is a shaper here? So, you know, just a few more things. Speakers are not rigidly limited by the conventions. They can occasionally violate them, and not just by errors, but also by extension. So, you know, maybe if you had some, you know, folk music without written down, sheet uh, music, then uh, the musicians would occasionally modify the music just because they feel like it. And similarly, speakers often modify language to uh, um, improve it or to, to do something special. Sure. Then... Can I, can I just raise this shaped by yeah. issue? And uh, I don't know if you're going to talk later on about Rudy Keller's ideas of objects of the third kind and language being one example of the unintentional product of intentional acts. Right, yes, that, that is the so best, really the best thing. Insight. And yeah. if we take your skepticism about this and think um, speakers use audience design substantially, right? So they, they make coding choices based on their assessment of the situation in a range of ways. Yes. Those begin as moment to moment choices in the act of speaking. That doesn't guarantee that they'll be conventionalized, but statistically, if people make those choices frequently enough, they can then be learned and incorporated into the system. So right. that seems to me to be a plausible account of how that shaping can occur yes. without invoking a creator or a teleological. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So Rudi Keller's book on language change from 1994 has been uh, very important for my own thinking and I think it's a fantastic book. So if you are interested in language change and uh, need some uh, vacation reading or bedside reading or so, it's so beautifully and easily written. It's not difficult. It, it's, it's just very entertaining but very uh, profound uh, in its message. Uh, now, Bill Croft, who I cite here for uh, you know his his book, you know, it's much heavier, you know, much harder to read book on language change. Uh, he's actually critical of Keller, and I I haven't been able to understand the difference between them yet because uh, Bill Croft is one of my superheroes, and uh, and Rudi Keller has written this one really brilliant book, which I also uh, <coughs> like very much. So I don't have anything in particular to contribute. Uh, to this, so I just uh, leave you with this slide. And uh, the one thing that I uh, wanted to mention is that you know, when thinking of language change as an evolutionary process, uh, the interesting thing is that increasingly, um, <clears throat> people, as scholars, are also thinking of cultural change in other domains as an evolutionary process. And next week in Jena, there will be the inaugural uh, conference of the Cultural Evolution Society. Um, so the Max uh, Planck Institute department where I work now is called the Department of Linguistic and Cultural Evolution. So they also study uh, cultural evolution and they do this often in a quantitative and increasingly uh, rigorous way. Um, <coughs> and um, um, I hope that uh, you know, some uh, 
consensus insights will emerge from this field that will then also increasingly have an influence on linguistics. Okay, but um, you know, be because you know, I thought I couldn't really contribute anything, I just wanted to mention one article uh, which I read a couple of months ago and which was really uh, nice. Uh, experimental work on optional marking. Since I mentioned differential object marking yesterday quite prominently, uh, <clears throat> there's a nice uh, experimental paper in the Journal of Memory of Language by Kromada and Jäger on optional object marking in Japanese. So in uh, both 6a here the criminal attacked the police officer and in 6b the police officer attracted the criminal, um, the object marker is optional. In written Japanese I think you have to have it, but in spoken Japanese uh, they say it's optional, and uh, what they find uh, is uh, in their recall experiments is that Japanese speakers are more likely to produce case marking when the grammatical function assignment indicated by case marker would otherwise be hard to infer. This preference contributes to robust information transfer by providing additional cues to the intended sentence interpretation when they are most needed. So this is work by psychologists using psychological methods, and they're primarily interested in how sentence processing works, and there's alternative theories of sentence processing. Apparently some theories say that all the variation in sentence processing is located in sentence production. Um, and uh, now these authors, and Jäger and a couple of other important works, have argued that in sentence uh, processing, actually audience design, this is a, a term that uh, Nick Evans just mentioned, uh, is really quite important. I think they don't use the term audience design, they use kind of robustness of information transmission or something like that because audience design I think was kind of entertained in the 1970s and then by the early 80s it had been compromised or so, it, at least that's a story that I, I once heard. Uh, so, uh, but I s still think it's, uh, it's a nice term and, and anyway, I'm, I don't know about psychology, um, I just read this paper and thought that it fit, fits very well uh, with the overall um, story that I'm telling. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so um, now um, I'm going to discuss uh, Baibi and Cristofaro, and also um, again Anderson, um, <clears throat> and again this notion of recurrent paths of change. So uh, remember that uh, I said that we really need constraints, we need universals of change, unidirectionality of change to explain um, current distributions. And now uh, John Bailey, of course, made, made some really um, great discoveries in the uh, 1980s, uh, published also in Bailey and Dahl, and you know, inspired also by Austin Dahl's work. Grammatical markers of tense aspect and modality develop in recurrent ways across languages. So. Uh, all those of you who know anything <laughs> at all about tense and aspect <laughs> know much of this, so I'm not going to say much uh, about it. So uh, perfectives uh, uh, tend to come from uh, resultative expressions from uh, finish or from come from, and then they become anteriors, and then these become uh, perfectives or past tenses. Then there's the present imperfective past where Expressions like be located at or movement while or reduplication turns into progressive and that then becomes the present imperfective. And futures come from want, movement, or adverbs after, and they first develop an intention meaning and then a future meaning. So in her 2006 paper, uh, John Bybee um, highlights um, these results again and says that, look, this is the really interesting thing about language. The true universals of language are not synchronic patterns at all, but the mechanisms of change that create these patterns. So she says, in, in the end, you really don't have any synchronic universals. Uh, you know, when you try to make synchronic universals of tense and aspect, it's not so easy, but there's these very strong um, <coughs> diachronic universals, and she kind of generalizes this in this way. And then there's also been a couple of other authors, um, <coughs> so Bickel 2007 says it's a matter of current debate whether universal preferences result from preference principles that guide or select the result of the acrony, so that's so functional adap adaptive constraints, or from what he calls locally motivated preferred pathways of change, and he cites Bybee and Blevins for that, and also Planck uh, 
it has this distinction between achronic laws and diachronic laws. Maybe achronic, that may, I think that is a term that, that I would like because it seems to me that saying that functional adaptive constraints are diachronic is kind of strange because there's diachronic change in order to reach a certain goal, right? So that diachronic is not the main thing. It's also strange to say that they're synchronic uh, because synchronic is a system but, but the functioning of a system does not depend directly on the system. You see that only if you look at it dynamic. So maybe achronic or panchronic also would be a better term. Anyway, this is just uh, terminology. Um, another example here again, Anderson, who says that there are no substantive universals of language. The regularities arise from common paths of change. So one common path of change, he says, is the development of past perfective forms in Indo-Aryan languages, and I think similarly actually in uh, Iranic languages, uh, <coughs> where um, as a result we have an accusative or neutral system uh, in the present tense, Ram drives a car, so uh, the car is in the nominative and Ram is in the nominative, but then Ram has driven the car, Ram is in the ergative. And the reason we get this ergative is that it derives from a passive-like construction. And then conversely, in Georgian, uh, we also have a similar pattern with uh, accusative alignment here and ergative alignment here. Uh, but it seems that in the imperfective, the Georgian accusative alignment developed from an antipassive-like construction. So now here comes my my uh, objection. How can diachrony uh, can diachrony also explain universals? Um, and uh, Anderson actually is kind of ambiguous. He also says, as it happens, common source for a new perfective and new imperfective, um, although they're quite unrelated to each other, you know, it's an accidental convergence, right? He used this term, accidental convergence. But can universal patterns be the result of accidental convergence? I don't think so. I think he would have to claim that if this is really universal, if we get the ergative in the past and the accusative in the present, that it's only apparently uh, no, either only apparently uh, um, accidental or, or only apparently universal. So I don't know what he would like to claim. Uh, um, my own feeling is that perhaps it isn't universal after all, because I, I know it only from Georgian and Indo-Iranic. I don't know this kind of development from other languages, or maybe Armenian. Is, uh, old Armenian has this ergative, only the past tense, maybe. But it's also the same kind of region, right? Armenian also strongly influenced by Iranic. To some extent. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. 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 Somewhat more complicated. Right, right. Rather some <coughs> to use. Okay, so what I'm saying here again is recurrent change or passive change is not the same as a mutational constraint. If a change A to B is very common, this cannot explain any observed synchronic universal tendency unless the observed change is also uh, inexistent. So, so what would be mutational constraints? Well, actually, the one that I thought about most is grammaticalization. So I wrote this paper in 1999 and then again 2004. Um, and I still think that the 1999 story is, was a pretty good one, but it's, grammaticalization is really complicated. And it's not really relevant in the present context because grammaticalization is, seems to be really a kind of strong tendency for content items to become function items and the other way around never happens. But uh, that doesn't seem to result in synchronic patterns. So for synchronic universals, grammaticalization doesn't do anything. Uh, <coughs> then um, other common paths of change. Um, now, is it the case that perfective past forms only develop from anteriors? Well, no, not really. They can also come from earlier past forms, like the Germanic ED past, right? Supposedly, that comes from an auxiliary that was already past. Or can, can future forms only develop from intention forms? Well, no, they can also develop from old present. So, you know, it's, it's true that, that there are these pathways, but it's really not so easy uh, to argue that 
some changes are really universal. It also happens, uh, th that is also the case because we know so little about language change in many parts of the world, right? So an another reason why functional adaptive constraints are easier to uh, justify is that we know a lot about the world's languages, but what actually their history is, uh, is in many cases uh, problematic. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now I have two more quotations from Anderson and uh, Cristoforo here, who are actually both, almost at the same time, in the same year, providing arguments against their approach. Um, so Anderson himself says that these changes are quite unrelated to each other. Uh, that we just saw, so the Georgian change and the in the Iranic change have nothing to do with each other, and uh, Cristoforo, she actually talks about coding asymmetries of the sort I talked about yesterday. She talks about zero singulars and overt plurals. And she says different instances of the same configuration can be a result of very different processes. Uh, for example, for logical erosion, the transfer of plural meaning from a quantifier to an accompanying element and the grammaticalization of distributives into plural markers can all give rise to the same configuration, right? So for logical erosion, that would be English day days. In Proto-Germanic, there was a suffix in both cases. There was a uh, nominative suffix z, and then there were suffix in all the other cases, and they were lost. And in the plural, they were not lost. Presumably, she says, for phonological reasons. Then the next is transfer of plural meaning from a quantifier to an accompanying element. So originally this meant some of the children and then it becomes children. Um, and in Southern Paiute she says this originally meant houses here and there, so it had a distributive meaning and developed from a distributive, distributive to a plural meaning. So she says these processes do not obviously have anything in common. Uh, now, it could be that the convergence of diverse processes on a uniform result is accidental, but in that case it wouldn't really be convergence, uh, and it couldn't, be, couldn't explain universal tendency. So, you know, when I hear the term convergence, then I think it, it can't be accidental, right? So if, uh, you know, if you meet one of your friends uh, somewhere, um, I don't know, in the center of the city, that could be an accident if you meet two of your friends and they were not together. That's an extremely unlikely accident. If you meet 10 of your friends, it's so unlikely that it really can't be. It, it has to be convergence in the sense that you, you agreed to meet. Yeah. Are we creating problems for ourselves by using the word process rather than something like selective bias? Because uh, imagine a biological analogy. Uh, it's useful for some population somewhere else it's arisen in some other place on the genome, it's the same selective bias, but you would call that a different process. Alternatively, you might get uh, mutations in a population which get favoured in exactly the same way, but in one case the mutation arises due to radioactive radiation, in another place due to incomplete copying of a gene in solar radiation or something, the source of the mutation is different, but the selection pressure, favorite, is the same. And by calling it different processes, you're not, you're, you're putting those two things together in a good way. Well, you are giving my argument, basically, because uh, my argument is that this, it's the selection pressure that uh, makes the plural longer than the singular. And uh, these processes are different, uh, kind of superficially, they give rise to very similar outcomes, um, and that is apparently due uh, to the functional adaptive desire to have an overt plural and a zero singul singular. Uh, but Cristoforo uh, has a, a kind of different uh, presupposition. So, uh, Let's skip to the next slide and go to this one. Uh, 
And this actually comes from Bybee's 88 article, the one that I mentioned earlier, and that overall it is really very uh, interesting uh, and important article. I mean, at the time it was important for me. But when I reread it now, I realized that she states a presupposition um, that's not really valid. So she says, the validity of a principle as explanatory can only be maintained if it can be shown that the same principle that generalized over the data also plays a role in the establishment of the conventions. So, you know, when the conventions get established, so when the plural marking arises, it has to be uh, motivated, uh, or you, in, in the change you have to see the motivation. So, so um, Christophero says, these functional explanations have not been based on the actual diachronic processes that give rise to this distribution in individual languages. Many such processes do not provide evidence for the postulated dependencies between grammatical phenomena. But I think this is wrong uh, because uh, if um, generalization is due to functional adaptation, we do not expect uniform ways in which the results have come about, just like we don't expect uniform ways in which malaria resistance uh, develops, for example. So, or I have this example here of wings. Wings are adaptive. We don't expect wings to arise in uniform ways. The wings of birds, bats, and insects quite famously have diverse origins, arose by diverse paths of change. In general, we do not know much about language change. I mentioned this earlier. Why it, why it happens, the primary evidence of functional adaptive explanations is the fit between the causal factor and the observed outcome. The primary evidence is not the change. And it seems that Bybee and Christofaro have this view that somehow the, the, the fact that, it change, uh, that, that an outcome is functional must be visible in the change. But I think that if there's a good fit, so if languages, for example, overwhelmingly prefer the kinds of word orders that allow easy parsing, as in Hawkins, or if they tend to show economic coding of grammatical categories, then the best explanation is in functional adaptive terms as long as there is some way, way for languages to, ex to acquire the properties. So, you know, if, if it, languages could never get there, mm -hmm. right? You know, in, in biology, there's this, uh, you know, some, some people talk about, you know, why are there no animals on wheels, right? I mean, wheels are obviously useful for transport, right? And because humans invented wheels, we can now, you know, drive faster than, than any animal can run uh, or so on. You know, wheels, it seems, simply cannot be constructed by the mechanisms that evolutionary biology uh, has at its uh, disposal. Um, but in language change, there's kind of always such a mechanism. So now if we look at other fields, explanations uh, of regularities in the worldwide distribution of cultural traits, for example, they also appeal to functional adaptive Factors. So in anthropology, you know, sometimes religion is explained by pro-sociality or monogamy is explained by group beneficial effects. Now the issue here is whether better explanations are available. It's not whether there's a way for marriage or religion to develop. As far as I can see, none of this literature has asked, you know, through which pathways, you know, how, how, how do people come up with the idea that there's a God, you know, what, what previous experience do they reanalyze or something like that. I mean, in, in linguistics, this notion of reanalysis re and, and so on is often really useful, but not so well understood, I feel. Uh, not as well under understood as the functional uh, motivations. So, um, basically, when the result is preferred, any kind of change can give rise to the results. We don't need to understand the nature of the change let alone show that the change was motivated by the result. So, so the move that I'm making here with respect to Christopher's argument is to say that her requirements are unreasonable. Now, that may uh, not be a particularly nice way of countering what she says, but it, I think it's important to think about these issues um, because uh, they are really very deep questions uh, of uh, how language and grammar uh, functions. So just briefly about some diverse paths of shortness of coding, since shortness of coding was so prominent in uh, the last two lectures. Um, so this is clearly functionally adaptive, but what are the pathways that lead to length asymmetries? 
and actually Zipf, who discovered this in 1935, uh, he didn't talk much about it, but he said, well, you know, sometimes we, get, we have clipping, so long words like laboratory get shortened to words like lab. Um, and now <coughs> Bybee cites Zipf and says, well, my own view is that high-frequency words undergo reductive changes at a faster rate than low-frequency words. The major mechanism is gradual phonetic reduction. So that's different from clipping, right? Clipping is not gradual. It's um, very abrupt and brutal. And um, if you know anything about historic linguistics, then you know that historic linguistics have not found much use for clipping, right? Clipping was apparently invented uh, in the 20th century or so, you know, as the number of new, long, unwieldy terms exploded because of technological development. Um, and uh, uh, many completely new concepts, like laboratory, became very frequent in people's everyday lives. I mean, it's, I'm not saying that it couldn't have happened in the past. Maybe, maybe it did occasionally, but it's certainly not a common uh, diachronic process. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I think that it's also very clear that John Bybee's uh, mechanism is not sufficient. So think of these pairs. So, you know, these are some of my favorite pairs of short versus long. They're semantically uh, similar. Um, hopefully in distribution of semantics they would <laughs> have uh, uh, show up together. Uh, so, but horse is much shorter than hippopotamus, car much shorter than cabriolet, church much shorter than cathedral. Now, why is that? Is that because the older word for horse was trisyllabic and got shortened, or the older word for car got shortened or so? No, no of course not. I mean, these, these long words are new words created from something else. Uh, they're compounds or derived. Um, and, and there's really a multiplicity, uh, a, a multitude of different um, factors uh, that are different ways in which <coughs> long words can arise. There's less ways in which short words, words can arise, but in particular, I think, in most of the time, uh, actually, uh, long, long words are long because they're com composed of something. This was a recent uh, interesting paper by Ronneberger Siebold on shortening techniques in German um, where she sort of classifies all kinds of uh, um, abbreviations, so clipping, acronymy, elliptical, uh, shortening, and so on. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, the overall uh, conclusion that she also draws is that they get shortened when they get more frequent and when we need uh, shorter forms, and there's just very many different ways. Uh, so, some of them may even be deliberate, right? So, so, you know, language change in general is not deliberate, but it's something that happens sort of in this evolutionary, unintentional way. Um, <coughs> in some of these cases, maybe there's uh, really deliberate, or probably there's quite deliberate. So those people who first tried to sell trucks uh, and said Lastkraftwagen, maybe they realized that if they market them as LKWs, then it's easier because the customers can easier, more easily remember uh, the term. But it's also interesting that sometimes artificial creations uh, don't really make it. So Ronneberger Siebold notes that Sommersee, Sommerschlussverkauf, is often abbreviated as SSV in writing, but nobody ever says that, probably because it's not frequent enough. You know, the, the, the the stores would like to have people talk about the summer sale all the time. <laughs> people just go there and, and pick up the cheap stuff, but they don't talk about it so frequently. I don't know. Anyway, so more importantly, uh, <coughs> grammatical coding asymmetries also very often arise not by shortening, but by lengthening of the less frequent forms. So the contrast between her, herself, or come, will come, or praise, let them praise, and so on, of course, they did not arise by shortening. There are cases of shortening, however. So the contrast in Polish between śpiewa and śpiewaś, so third person singular is a zero. Apparently that was used to be t, śpiewat, some time in Old Polish, and was dropped, uh, or between my and mine. So there's multi-convergence of different pathways by which coding asymmetries can come about, and which indicates that there's a preferred result. So if there's only one way in which 
uh, some phenomenon arises, and you don't know. Did it arise because uh, of the pathway that forced it, or did it arise because the goal that was desired? But if there's multi-convergence from different areas, then it must be um, um, functional adaptive, I would claim. Okay. Um, good. So now to one area that clearly um, concerns uh, lexical typology, again, uh, namely co expression universals. Um, and it seems to me that mutational constraints are the right explanation for co-expression universals. I have not thought enough about this, uh, but um, I cannot easily think of a good functional adaptive explanation. So this is a picture from uh, Yun et al. This uh, was a paper by some uh, mathematicians, um, uh, but also some linguists uh, on uh, um, co-lexification in uh, domains such as uh, earth, dust, ashes, sand, smoke, water, river, lake, mountain, stone, wind, sky, cloud, and so on. So various um, natural phenomena. And uh, when there's uh, very strong connecting lines, it means that many languages uh, co-express or co-lexify uh, these items. So moon and month was one that I mentioned earlier, right? So moon and sun is sometimes co-lexified, more often sun and day, then fire and light, or light and day, um, and so on. So these, they uh, have this very nice uh, picture. Um, there's, of course, various resources uh, for uh, co-lexification, also Mattis List's uh, webpage, and uh, many of you have thought about these uh, things and, and now my uh, my question is how does this arrive? Well, before I get to the question, another example of a really beautiful semantic map. This is from uh, Heiko Narok uh, and his colleague uh, Ito. Sorry, I don't remember the first name. You don't happen to know the person. Sorry, I should only say Narok and Ito. Okay, so they they looked at dozens of languages and um, elaborated uh, on the semantic map of um, uh, semantic roles, and what we see nicely here is that commutative and instrumental uh, are closely related, then agent is here on the other side, then we have here coordination, all kinds of other things like material, language use, ablative, co-participant, and so on. Uh, so so what, is the, what is the explanation of these? Uh, so, for example, why is instrumental intermediate between commutative and ergative? Well, I would say uh, because commutative can be extended to instrumental, but not vice versa, and instrumental can extend to ergative, but not vice versa. Uh, now, commutative cannot extend directly to ergative, nor can ergative extend directly to commutative. So it's a constraint on the kinds of changes uh, that are possible. Next question, of course, is what is the explanation of this semantic extension? Why is it the case that you cannot uh, get directly from um, commutative to ergative is, is the explanation of proximity in semantic space. But what is semantic space? Is this a kind of UG of semantics? Is, it, is you know, our representation constrained? Is it a representational constraint? Right? Are we dealing with semantic representational constraints? And some people think like this. So in Croft 2001, there's a famous quotation he says, semantic maps are really great. They are a geography of the human mind, which can be read in the facts of the world's languages in a way that the most advanced brain scanning techniques cannot ever offer us. So please invest in linguists studying semantic maps rather than in these brain scanning machines. Uh, now, I'm not sure. If this were true, why do many changes only go in one direction or the other direction? Is it that uh, uh, geography of the human mind also has mountains and uh, valleys and so on. Well, we don't really know. 
and or I don't really know. And I think it would be wise to be a bit modest uh, about our ability to understand language change. Um, so, um, therefore, um, I would say uh, I don't attribute this to representational constraints. Or, or maybe I should say I have to because uh, I, I don't have any other explanation. So that, that might be another, uh, another um, way to go. But uh, currently it seems to me that uh, Christopher was actually right in this because she actually has a paper, I think I didn't cite it here, a paper from 2010 uh, where she argues uh, against the synchronic explanation of semantic maps. That was sort of when she started this whole uh, thing. There was a workshop on semantic maps uh, in Paris after the ALT conference. And, uh, and that's when Christopher started this whole program of replacing synchronic explanation by diachronic explanation. And, uh, and at the time, I found it very, um, very persuasive, actually. So I remember I had no disagreement with her at that time. I thought, well, yes, uh, sure. And one of her arguments was that uh, the, the kinds of semantic links that we get are often uh, of a different type. So some of them are more metaphorical, some of them are more metonymic. Uh, th there can be all kinds of different changes that give rise uh, to these patterns. Um, and so at the time I thought, well, yes, no, I'm not wedded to any alternative explanation of these kinds of universals. Uh, so it was only when she started extending her diachronic approach to my form frequency correspondences. I remember that was at the Dubrovnik syntax of the world's languages when she started saying, no, the alienable, inalienable uh, contrast, that's also diachronically explained. That I started thinking more about this. And, and so my preliminary conclusion is that Christopher was probably right about the co-expression or co lexification and I'm probably right about the coding asymmetries. So it's not that um, uh, you know any of these people are completely wrong, <laughs> but um, uh, in some respects, I think the functional adaptive constraints are better in some respects. Um, the um, um, mutational constraints are better. Okay, so this was my last slide. There's opportunity for more um, questions because we have five more minutes. Yes, please. Uh, my question is about the last story about semantic change. Mm -hmm. So uh, the two possibilities you indicated are so there are two meanings. They are collectified either because they are connected by something representationally, mm -hmm. or they are connected by something mutationally. So, but what if, at least from the end perspective, we uh, do not have any two, we do not have two meanings. We have two comparative concepts, uh, because uh, so for technological reasons we uh, need to distinguish, uh, to, uh, we need to distinguish the, the concepts by them. From the end perspective, so in Russian, uh, the um, elder brother did not evolve into younger brother, uh, and uh, neither did went vice versa. It's just one meaning from the end perspective. So, uh, isn't uh, this kind of representation constraint uh, uh, worth suggesting? Yeah, good, good question. Yes, this is, this is an important point uh, in the uh, semantic maps of this sort. You know, there's no um, presupposition that if a language has a form that, you know, here instrumental language, for example, that uh, instrument refers to s some physical implement like a hammer or so, and language, you know, I'm speaking in the English language or Presumably, in these languages, you would say speaking with English, something like that, right? So, now these speakers of these languages might say, well, no, that's not a different meaning. English is just an instrument, right? So, you know, often we say language is an instrument for expressing our thoughts. So, why, why should one then say it's a different meaning? So, and similarly, in, uh, you know, some of these languages, 
where you know, we would say, well, cloud and smoke, that's a different meaning. And they would say, no, it's cloud and smoke, it's the same thing. It's these little particles in the air that are visible and you know what color or so, that doesn't matter. We, we don't distinguish between different kinds of aerosols or, or whatever the scientific expression is. So, so it's true, if a language of this sort then has cloud-smoke co-lexification, it doesn't have to be the case that the smoke meaning extended to cloud, or the cloud extended to smoke. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but I don't know how these things come about. I, I don't know how this comes about. Um, basically, um, I mean, I must admit that I haven't thought so much about it. I, but I thought I should mention this uh, because uh, co-expression universals are actually very important. So if you look at the world atlas of language structures, then many of the maps are co-expression maps. So they ask, uh, is the instrumental expressed in the same way as the commutative, or is the genitive expressed in the same way as the relative clause, and, and so on. So many questions that we ask in typology are co-expression uh, questions of this sort. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me. But di did you suggest that this was an argument for the representational view, so that like Russian has just a single brother word, and that... A single brother concept. Concept, single yes. Brother, yes. Network. Right, right. And, but would that argue for uh, kind of mental, uh, universal, semantic atom brother or so? It, it wouldn't, right? I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the best proposal about semantic, innate semantic atoms is by Anna Vizbitska, of course. Um, and I think brother is not an uh, innate, is not one of the semantic primitives of Vizbitska. Um, so, uh, yeah, if, if uh, Vizbitska is right, you know, if that is the representational constraints on our meanings, then certainly many more co-lexifications than these would be possible, it seems. So on the Vizbitska type approach, you cannot explain this. You need a really much richer universal semantics, uh, U UGS, universal grammar semantics. Yeah. Nick. Well, I won't buy into the brother question now because we spent a lot of time <laughs> in the morning, but I want to go back to the Bill Croft quote which you cited, mm -hmm. which I find disturbing the universalizing yeah. and, and these co-lexification studies which are Yeah, now Croft mostly talks about grammar, and in grammar it's sort of easier to see universals and less easy to see culture-specific uh, peculiarities. And I think what he would answer is to say that, okay, this is the geography of the human mind. He's actually co-author on this paper, so you can read <laughs> what that paper says. I, I don't know which party he, uh, he wrote, but then he would say, well, yes, in some cultures you have this sky-wind co-lexification, and in other cultures you have a sky-cloud co-lexification, and this may be culture-specific, and especially maybe region-specific, so maybe even in one entire continent. But the, the, these are all the possibilities, and things that go beyond this are not possible in the human mind. 
Uh, so cultures can choose between different uh, representationally possible uh, colexifications. Uh, but uh, the overall picture is universal. That's the idea. Well, I think the time is over now. So, so sorry. Yeah. Thank you.